Hi, everyone, and welcome uh, to our Tuesday get together to talk about the cerebellum and learn from each other. So, today, Happy New Year to you. I hope you're all doing well. Um, thank you for joining us. Today, we have uh, um, a uh, wonderful talk on the computation that takes place in the pontine nucleus as uh, the input arrives in the cerebellum. And, and Sam, uh, Sam is going to describe for us his work. Sam is uh, um, a postdoc at uh, Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at Columbia. He uh, is a person who he studied physics when he was in Italy, then went to Switzerland to EPFL to study um, neural dynamics with um, Wolfram Gerstner. And now he's a postdoc in the laboratory of Litwin Kumar. And um, uh, his, his work today is going to describe a, a interesting idea regarding how input from the cortex and the brainstem as it arrives in the ponds um, gets transformed and then it gets transformed again when it arrives um, in the cerebellum. So Sam, thank you for uh, teaching us today. Thanks Reza for the nice introduction and for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, the work I'm presenting today uh, was done during the first part of my postdoc in the group of Ashok Litwin Kumar uh, in collaboration, collaboration with Mark Wagner from NIH. And, and the topic is, as Reza already said, routing, uh, the routing pathways to uh, cerebellum and cerebellum-like structures. <clears throat> um, so cerebellum-like structures, as the name suggests, are um, uh, brain regions which share important similarities with the vertebrate cerebellum. And even though I'm sure that for this audience, uh, the need to go through the cerebellum anatomy, uh, let me just uh, briefly flesh, out, flesh the regions or the circuit elements that are going to be important for these talks. So uh, if we zoom in the cerebellar cortex, uh, we, we have the Purkinje cells, which are the the output neurons of the cerebellar cortex, which integrate inputs from a large number of granul cells. And the granul cells, which receive input from mossy fibers, uh, form an incredibly vast layer. So there is an uh, incredibly large number of granul cells in the, in the mammalian cerebellum. And the presence of this vast layer of granul like cells is also common to other cerebellum like. Uh, structures. And some examples are the electrosensory lobe in the electric fish, the dorsal cochlear nucleus in mammals, and for our purposes, also the mushroom body in the insect olfactory system. And I'm going to today talk a little bit about uh, this last structure as well, alongside the vertebrate cerebellum. Um, so let me just briefly introduce it to you. So, oh, sorry. Um, so in the insect olfactory system, neurons which sense odors in the antenna project down to the antenna lobe from which neurons are uh, sent to the mushroom body. And here the canyon cells are the analogous of the granule cells as they form um, also kind of a large layer for, for insect uh, compared to the size of the insect brain. And the reason why I want to talk also about the system is not only to show that what I'm going to discuss also apply in this case, but also because I think that because more it is, no, is known about the statistics of the input and the connectivity in this system, it might hopefully maybe teach us something about, uh, about the cerebellum itself. Okay, so the presence of this, this vast layer of granule cells has attracted the attention of theorists since very early on, since the work of Marin Albus in the early 70s, and the idea that has carried on until more recent approaches, um, or at least amongst many of more recent approaches, is the idea that granule cells should recode the input coming from mossy fibers uh, by essentially performing random nonlinear mixing of their input in such a way that they can expand the dimensionality of the representation and um, form an appropriate basis from which uh, essentially the Purkinje cell could then uh, learn something useful just by adjusting the readout weights. So theories based on this kind of ideas have been quite successful in explaining some of the anatomical features of the cerebellum uh, from a normative perspective. And in particular, 
you can somehow have a, uh, an idea now of why there is this very large layer and also why the connectivity seems to be very sparse. Indeed, each crown cells receive a very small number uh, of inputs. However, there are some uh, important open questions. And, and for example, the granule cells seems to be uh, in recordings in vivo, seems to be much more selective and correlated than what you would expect based on these uh, random mixing theories. And uh, also previous normative theories have neglected the uh, statistical structure of the input by assuming that the input was random and uncorrelated. And um, by the end of this talk, I hope to convince you that some of these two points are, can be, are actually more related than they seem at first sight. So what, uh, how does information reach this uh, mossy fiber layer? So in the cerebellum, one of the main uh, or one of the important pathway that, uh, uh, that brings information to the cerebellum is the corticocerebellar pathway. And as the name suggests, this uh, originates in the cortex where layer five pyramidal cells uh, project down to the pontine nuclei in the brainstem from where the signals are sent only to, um, to the cerebellum. And in this uh, pathway, there, is, uh, there are two steps. So in the cortical pontine step, there is actually a compression, if we think in terms of number really of fibers. And this compression is estimated to be between two and 10 folds. And then there is, uh, there is an expansion uh, in the, uh, in the, from the pons to the granule cell layer, which is estimated to be around 30 folds. So there is this compression expansion motif, which uh, interestingly is also found in other cerebellum-like structures. And in the insect olfactory system, for example, we also have uh, a compression from the uh, other receptors in the antenna to the antenna lobe. And in this case, it's actually a very structured compression because um, olfactory sensory neurons, which express the same other receptors, converge all into the same glomerulus, as I indicate here with this color coding. And then once again, the representation is expanded in the, in the mushroom body, uh, to the mushroom body canyon cell uh, representation. So we've seen that these two um, very different uh, structures actually share this bottleneck kind of architecture with a compression followed by an expansion. And this may now seem slightly counterintuitive in the light of what I told you at the beginning, uh, which is that the, uh, the, the role of granule cell layers, at least according uh, to random mixing theories, is to form this high dimensional representation by doing random mixing. So it seemed at, at the very least kind of useless to have this compression step uh, beforehand if the, if the goal is any way to um, do random mixing. So the first question that I'm gonna to try to address is what is the functional role of the compression layer? And the second question that I'm gonna to try to address um, arises from the observation that there are some differences in the way that this um, bottleneck motif is implemented in these uh, two systems. And in particular, one salient difference is the presence of lateral connectivity. So in the antenna lobe, there is a very strong presence of lateral connectivity driven by, by interneurons. So these glomeruli actually interact with each other quite a lot. While in the pons, it seems that uh, there is not a lot of lateral connectivity. And actually, it seems that uh, in rodents, there seems to be almost no, uh, no lateral connections. <clears throat> so the, the second uh, question is, can we understand from this difference in the biological implementation from a functional perspective? And all the, all the results I'm gonna show you today, uh, you can find them in our preprint, which is on Biarchive. Okay, so we try to answer these questions uh, using a, a modeling approach. So we model this bottleneck motif using a three layer feed forward neural network. And for all results that I'm gonna to present to you today, we're gonna to consider the case in which the compression is a very simple linear compression. 
And then the compression is followed by an expansion, with it, which is random, sparse, and nonlinear. Then after the expansion layer, which is the granule cell layer, we assume that there is a single, for, for today's purposes, a single readout neurons, which represents a Purkinje cell. <clears throat> so the first uh, question, the first modeling question is, what are biologically relevant input statistics? So it's pretty obvious that if these inputs were random and uncorrelated, then there should be no advantage in having this compression layer. So whatever advantage this uh, bottleneck motif might yield should stem from the presence of non-trivial connectivity in the input. So indeed, uh, in, in the biological system, these inputs are not going to be um, uncorrelated. And for example, in, in the insect olfactory system, we know that other receptor neurons which express the same other receptors will be highly correlated because essentially they respond in the same way up to, up to some degree of noise. Therefore, if we look at the uh, input covariance matrix, um, we'll, we expect to observe something like uh, something with a very clear block structure in which the diagonal blocks are uh, large and positive, and of course there can be uh, some off-diagonal non-zero entries as well. So this we call a clustered representation. On the other hand, in the case of the corticocerebellar pathway, uh, we consider a um, we, we know that the representation is typically dominated by relatively few modes of activity which are distributed across neurons, meaning that we typically do not observe um, clusters of neurons which are which all do the same thing, which are highly correlated, but we, we observe something more like like that looks like this, um, which is some distributed kind of uh, input representation. So to model these two um, kind of input statistics, we, um, we proceed as follows. So we assume that uh, there is a set of D task variables where D is a small number compared to the number of neurons. And in these task variables encode all the information you need to solve a certain task. In this case, I show you, I, I, just for presentation purposes, I just show you two task variables. And then we embed them in an n-dimensional input layer. This is the input layer in a linear fashion. So linear means just matrix multiplication. And we do this in, in two um, extreme way. Um, to give rise to a cluster representation, we separate this input uh, population into a set of the non-overlapping subpopulations. And we, um, we set up the system in such a way that each subpopulation responds to um, a separate task variables. So here in this case, I show you three, uh, uh, you know, six neurons in total in the input, three in code Z1 and other three in code Z2. At the other extreme, to get a distributed representation, we assume that each neurons in the input layer encodes a different random combination of, um, of these uh, different task variables. So in, the, in this way, each of these, um, each of these uh, neurons would look slightly different, but the overall representation would still be low dimensional. And that's because we, we, are, we are doing a linear embedding. So this cannot change the dimensionality of the representation. So this is all the task relevant activity. And of course, on top, we're also gonna add some task relevant activity, which will have its own statistics. Okay, so with this kind of input statistics uh, set up, we then take a um, normative approach, meaning that we look at the performance of the network in a task. And we start by considering a very simple task that has the advantage that we can understand pretty well which is a classification task. Uh, crucially, this is defined in the space of the task variables. So in this, in this case, in this two-dimensional space, we set up some patterns and we associate some labels to them. So each of these dots is actually, a, you can think of them as a cloud of points. And the Purkinje cells has to solve this task. 
And we're going to assume that the uh, expansion weights, so the mossy fiber to ground cell weights, are random and fixed, while the um, parallel fiber to Purkinje cell weights are adjusted using a biologically plausible Hebbian rule. So with this assumption, I'm going to um, consider different strategies for the compression weights. And in particular, the question is, is there any advantage to having a compression layer, given that we have this random mixing afterwards? And to test this uh, as a first approach, we're going to consider the case in which we can uh, tune the weight as we, as we please. And therefore, we try to train them using gradient descent. So, in uh, um, and so I'm going to now show you the results. So here I'm showing you the fraction of errors in this task. The uh, chance level is at 0.5 um, for different network architecture. And the one in which we train the weights is this purple box here. And here I compare it to uh, two other different network architecture. And the red uh, box represents the performance of a network in which the compression weights are random. So there is no tuning in that case. And as you can see, it is much, it's much worse compared to the case in which we learned them. And interestingly, this is actually also worse than a, what we call a single step expansion network, which is a network in which we essentially remove the compression layer and we directly wire the input to the expansion layer. So this would be equivalent biologically to not having the ponds and directly having layer five neurons projecting to granule cells. And this uh, strategy, even though it compress, uh, performs better than random compression, still performs uh, significantly worse than when we learn the compression. So the advantage of uh, using this simple task is that, as I said, we can, uh, you know, we can analyze it uh, analytically. So that's what we did. And uh, what we understood is that we can actually build what we call an optimal compression um, here in green. And what, this, what we need to do in order to have optimal compression is to have compression layer neurons uh, be tuned to task relevant input principle components. So what, what does this mean? It means that in, uh, the compression layer should first of all, remove task irrelevant activity. And that's, that's quite intuitive. And then it should also decorrelate the task relevant activity uh, by extracting the principal uh, component. Um, so to get a bit more of intuition of this uh, mechanism, we can look at two uh, metrics of the neural representation, which determines the performance in this very simple task. And these are the dimension and the noise of the representation. So dimension is in this top row and noise, I call it capital delta is in this bottom row. And here I'm showing you these two metrics across the network. So these bars are color coded um, according to the layer, network layer and for different kind of for different network architecture so what you can see here is that if you do random compression then you suffer in both of these metrics indeed uh, you first of all have a smaller dimension expansion compared to the learned compression case so the higher the dimension the better the performance in this task so this is is uh, the, uh, expanding the dimension is beneficial and you also suffer in terms of noise because by doing random compression, as you would expect, you do, do not remove noise. You do not remove task irrelevant activity. And therefore you have quite a lot of noise at the expansion layer, which harms the performance. While when learning the compression weights, you both expand the dimension and reduce noise. And this is the same trend that we observe in, uh, in what we call the optimal compression. So, what we understand from this analysis is that the advantage of having learned compression weights, or let's say compression weights, which are tuned to the input statistics, is that uh, we arises from both increasing the dimension and decreasing the noise. So what does this mean uh, to have compression layer neurons which are tuned to the, in, to the input principal components, to the task relevant principal components? So this, of course, depends on the input representation. And if the input representation is a cluster representation, then uh, also the PCs, the principal component, will have this uh, clustered structure in which 
uh, each PC is basically encode a different subpopulation. Therefore, a way to have compression layer neurons be tuned to these uh, different PCs is to essentially hardwire it. So to have one population projecting only to one compression layer neuron and, and, and so on. On the other hand, for a distributed representation, then what we need is that compression layer neurons should listen to a relatively large number of units and uh, combine them in the appropriate way with the appropriate weights to uh, extract the input principal component. And the, the encouraging thing is that um, this, is at, this is at least consistent with what we know about the biological systems in that um, in the insect olfactory system, as I mentioned at the beginning, we do observe this segregated um, compression in which different clusters in the input project to different glomeruli. So this is exactly the biological solution. Um, while even though much less is known about the cortical pontine compression, we do uh, know from recent evidence that um, neurons in the, in the ponds seems to integrate uh, and not just relay information coming from the cerebral cortex. Okay, so to summarize this part, um, I've shown you that compression is useful, but only if it is adapted to the input statistics and instead it is, it is actually harmful. And to do so, compression layer neurons should be tuned to task relevant input principal components. Okay, so, um, so if, uh, I don't know if there are any questions in this part. Okay, so I'm going to then continue and make. Um, so I would like to make a brief detour now before uh, applying this theory to our biological systems uh, more precisely. And what I would like to show you is that uh, compression, uh, this bottleneck architecture is also an efficient solution to this routing problem. So indeed, you might be wondering that uh, because we are considering linear compression, we could in fact uh, build um, an effective network which has only two layers, so without a compression layer, in which the weights are built just as the product of, of these two matrices for any of these any kind of matrices, and we will obtain mathematically the same network. And this is indeed mathematically true, but what uh, we would like to show now is that this would be a very inefficient solution, this problem. Indeed, if we do this naively just by doing this product, then we would obtain a very dense expansion matrix, which would use an incredibly large amount of resources because, uh, because of the large size of the kernel cell layer. So the question is, can we do it uh, more smartly? So um, can the granule cells do essentially the, the two jobs in one? So could they, in principle at least, uh, both do the decorrelation and denoising part, which I said should be done by the pawns, and also mix, do the random mixing and dimensionality expansion? So even assuming that this was possible biologically, which uh, I would be skeptical about, but even assuming that this was possible, there is an intrinsic limitation that we think cannot be overcome. And this is the fact that because granule cells only have access to a relatively few input, then they have an extremely partial view of the input statistics. So if you imagine that this is the full input covariance matrix, each individual granule cells only sees a very small number of entries because of the small number of inputs. And therefore, any its estimation of the input principal components would be uh, very imprecise. And indeed, if we equip this single step expansion network with this sort of local decorrelation mechanism, as we call it, we uh, obtain no ad advantage essentially in terms of performance in this, once again, in this classification task compared to a single step expansion with purely random weights. So here you should compare the black um, line to the gray line, and you see they're essentially one on top of each other, while you do better if you have this kind of architecture. Of course, um, this problem would be milder if ground cells would, have a would receive a larger number of inputs. However, because of, once again of the large number of ground cells, this would be a very costly solution. And indeed, what I'm showing you here is that it would be much better to perform this local decorrelation mechanism at the cortical pontine synapses compared to uh, using this me the same mechanism at uh, 
the uh, mossy fiber to ground cell synapses. And here I'm showing you the fraction of errors uh, for these two strategies for the same total number of, of synapses for relatively realistic uh, numbers. So I would like to add a last bullet point to what I showed you before is that the bottleneck, this kind of bottleneck architecture is also efficient from the perspective of using as little, as few synapses as possible. Okay, great. So I'm going to um, now use, apply this, this theory to um, the, the two biological systems that we're interested in. And let me briefly start from, uh, let me briefly go over the, um, the insect olfactory system. And in this case, as I already mentioned, the representation is clustered. So we look something uh, like in this schematic. And using the theory, we, we can build this optimal compression matrix, which uh, um, which would also look like something like, uh, you know, would also have this block kind of structure. And the question is, does this, can we relate this to the actual biological connectivity? The biological connectivity actually emerges from two uh, terms. One is the feed-forward compression from the uh, factory sensor neurons to the antenna lobe. And one are the recurrent uh, connections uh, within the antenna lobe. And under the assumption of stationarity, this, uh, we can summarize them in a single uh, compression matrix, which is given by this product. Uh, so this is the feed-forward part, and this is the recurrent part. So interestingly, what we found uh, is that um, we can also factorize this optimal compression matrix in a, in a similar way. Um, so we can always do this factorization. And what we found is that this uh, rectangular matrix actually matches the biological compression in which all neurons expressing the same receptors converge onto the same glomerulus. So from the functional perspective, what this means is that this compression onto glomeruli um, has the role of uh, removing noise, while the interactions within uh, the antenna lobe among glomeruli are uh, useful to essentially remove residual correlations uh, between other uh, receptors of uh, of the same of, of different types. And uh, so I don't have time to go through it uh, today, but we also showed um, uh, how this uh, interaction should look like in the presence of re relatively realistic um, input statistics in the insect olfactory system. So to summarize this part, uh, I've shown you that clustered input statistics as in the insect olfactory system naturally give rise to this sort of glomerular organization. So in other words, if you have clusters in your input, you want to build something like glomeruli. And furthermore, uh, lateral interactions among glomeruli are useful to remove uh, residual correlations. Okay, so let's now move on to the uh, cerebellum case. And as I already mentioned here, the cortical representation is distributed. And uh, however, we can play exactly the same game and build our optimal compression matrix. However, now because the uh, representation is distributed, this optimal compression matrix will have both positive and negative entries. And now this, this might be uh, somewhat of a problem because we know that corticopontin um, neurons are excitatory. Uh, uh, and also, we already mentioned that pontinuclei, as here I'm saying, to simplify, I say no lateral inhibition. And of course, uh, one can think of disynaptic pathways to maybe have effective uh, you know, inhibitory uh, connections. However, for, for the sake of the argument, let me now assume that we only have uh, the possibility to use excitatory weights uh, to compress the representation. And what we ask is, can we approximate the optimal compression matrix using only excitatory weights? And the answer was surprising to us, and it was uh, yes. And, and uh, here I'm showing you two metrics, uh, the, the two metrics I introduced be you before, the dimension of the representation, in this case, in the compression layer, and the noise of the representation as a function of the input redundancy. So this n is the number of neurons in the input and d is the number of task variables. 
And what you can see is that the, the blue line, which is the purely excitatory compression, approaches the optimal uh, line, which is the green one, as uh, long as we have enough input redundancy. So in other words, if the number of neurons compared to the number of task variables is large enough, then we can approximate uh, the uh, optimal compression using only excitatory weights. And the striking thing is that this is a property only of distributed representation. So if we do the same analysis for a clustered representation, what we see is that while we can do a pretty good job in removing noise, uh, there is no way we can remove correlations uh, um, among different different clusters using only ex excitatory weights. So this this is nice because this also explains, uh, in our view, why you have a lot of lateral interactions among the Maryli, which are instead seems to be absent in in the pods. Okay, so what I've shown you so far, um, it's all taken as uh, an example, this very uh, simple um, classification task, which you might argue is not maybe extremely relevant for, for the cerebellum. So we tested that uh, these results also hold for a more uh, biologically relevant task, and we considered a forward model task. So forward modeling um, as been um, a function attributed to the cerebellum since many years now. Um, and to model this, we took a very simple uh, two-joint arm model with two uh, joints. And the task consists in, uh, given the initial condition of the arm and the two torques, uh, learn to predict the, the position of the arm a certain time afterwards, certain time delta afterwards. And uh, we use the same network to, to try to learn this task. And what we found is that um, basically the results hold true. Most of our results that I showed you until now hold true. In particular here, I'm showing you the mean squared error in this task as a function of the amount of noise in the input for different architectures. And you can see that both the optimal and the purely excitatory uh, compression perform uh, pretty well and certainly much better than what you can do using only random compression weights. Okay, so uh, let me zoom out uh, for a second and I've shown you how this um, glomerular structure and the lateral interactions can be understood from the fact of having a clustered input representation. Um, in contrast to a distributed representation, which instead can be uh, compressed using only excitatory weights. So I would like to also um, uh, mention another difference between these two systems, which is that uh, while in the insect olfactory system case, the input covariance, uh, the input statistics have likely been stationary over evolutionary, evolutionary uh, time scales. So basically allowing this uh, connectivity to be fine-tuned by evolution. In the uh, cortical cerebellar pathway, we would like, uh, um, we essentially uh, think of the statistics as non-stationary. So for example, this could be due to uh, turnover in the neurons uh, in, in the cortex or to learning or other reason. Uh, so we would like uh, these compression weights to be sort of adapted uh, to um, to the, the changes in the input statistics. And so we asked whether we can uh, do so using Hebbian plasticity at cortical pontine synapses. And this was a natural candidate because we know since uh, very early, since very early work that Hebbian plasticity enables the extraction of the input principal components. Um, however, uh, uh, so, so what we did to test this was uh, to um, essentially assume that each pontine uh, neurons listen to a certain so limited number of inputs. So the, these connections is there is no full connectivity in this compression step, and therefore, as I already mentioned before, each neurons in the pons will have a sort of subsampled view of this input covariance, and therefore, we make an error in estimating the principal component. And what we studied is uh, how this error changes as we vary the uh, the in degree of the pontine uh, 
neurons. So this means how many neurons, sorry, how many inputs each neuron in the pons uh, receives. And what we realized is that here we're going to find a trade-off because if this number of input is too small, then basically this uh, compression would be essentially random. So there's no way we can estimate this, uh, the input principal components if the compression is random. While if this number is too large, then uh, we all neurons will essentially extract the same principal component. So therefore, if we look at the performance as a function of this Pontian in degree, we find this non-monotonic curve, which uh, allows us to uh, sort of propose that neurons in the pons should listen to essentially an intermediate number of neurons. So not as small as kernel cells, but also not, not hundreds of neurons. <clears throat> okay, so this result was based on Hebian uh, unsupervised learning, and um, by construction, since this is an unsupervised method, has uh, a limitation. And the limitation is that what happens when the dominant principal components are task irrelevant? So this, uh, this method would, in fact, would fail uh, in that case, because... Um, um, well, essentially, by construction, Hebbian learning would extract the strongest component, whether it's task relevant or not. So, so what we um, what we did is then to propose a solution to this problem, and uh, this was actually inspired by by the biology. So, indeed, um, what we noticed is that uh, there are uh, feedback connections from the deep cerebellar nuclei back to the pontid nuclei, and these connections are well known and was studied. However, they have been sort of ignored in the, in the more mod, in, in, the, in the modeling literature. And what we uh, propose is that this feedback is useful in order to essentially act as a self-supervisory signal. So this feedback will instruct the point in neurons uh, in order for them to sort of be able to extract the task relevant uh, signals from the input and to ignore the task relevant one. And so we tested this by extending our plasticity rule with this sort of self-supervisory uh, feedback mechanism in the same um, two-joint arm task that I discussed before. And what we found is that indeed this uh, feedback from DCN helps uh, the performance, in particular when noise in the input is very strong. So in this in this region of the parameter space, we have a better performance with this input from uh, the BCN compared to uh, without. Okay, so the last bit of results I would like to show you today is uh, that um, how this uh, learning mechanism relates to, to uh, experimental observation. And I mentioned at the beginning that uh, that uh, that there was this um, data that was in apparent contrast with uh, theories based on random mixing. So then we essentially we reanalyzed this data. So this data was collected by Mark Wagner, and the um, experimental setup was uh, was like this. So basically, he recorded uh, simultaneously from layer five pyramidal cells in the cortex and cerebellar granule cells while head-fix mice were performing a four-limb task in which they had to move this joystick in these L-shaped trajectories, either to the left or to the right. And uh, the two surprising results of this work were that um, granular cells were uh, more correlated than expected. Indeed, they were actually more correlated than layer five cells, and they were also pretty correlated with, uh, with layer five cells. And also ground cells were uh, quite selective to the task variables. And these are this is selectivity. And as you can see, ground cells are um, almost as selective as layer five cells. So this was initially seen as in contrast with, um, with, uh, uh, with random mixing theories. However, we would like, I would like to show you today that uh, if we assume that there is learning Court, uh, at cortical point in synapses, these uh, results can actually be reconciled with the theories. So to do so, we extended our model. So we, we take our bottleneck model and we use the data as an input. And we had also to extend the model by assuming that there are unobserved uh, layer five cells, which might end up projecting to the same population of recorded ground cells. <clears throat> 
And to set up this population, of course, we don't know much about this activity, but we assume that the statistics are essentially uh, are the same of the observed population, except that they might have a different signal to noise ratio. So noise might be stronger or weaker in, in this population. And, um, and then we vary this parameter, this free parameter, and see whether the model, so the observed ground cells statistics are compatible with the data. And these are the results. So here I'm varying the, the degree of noise at, at the, this unobserved population, this is sigma. And what you can see is that there is a regime in parameter space where the correlations um, of uh, ground cells with ground cells and ground cells with layer five cells are compatible between the data in solid lines and, sorry, the data in, in, in dash line and the model in, in solid lines. But this is the case only if we have Hebbian compression. And if we have random compression instead, we, uh, we observe that there is a, a very, uh, very large difference between the data and the model independently of how we set up this unobserved population. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to summarize. So I've shown you that the, this bottleneck architecture is a resource effective way to maximize the efficacy of this random expansion. I've shown you that learning at cortical protein synapses can be done with Hebbian plasticity and can explain these strong uh, granule cell correlations and selectivity. And also that the glomerular organization uh, in the insect olfactory system and, and the interglomerular interactions are a consequence of this cluster distribution. And finally, I showed you that distributed representation like the one in motor cortex are more easily relayed using purely accelerated weights compared to clustered ones. And with this, I would like to thank uh, Ashok, my mentor, uh, collaborator Mark, uh, Marjorie from Ashok's group, and Larry and Nate for their feedback throughout this project. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, let me see if we can have some questions for you. Let me all start things up. So Sam, one of the um, critical ideas that you presented was that the uh, compression layer neurons can't just be randomly selecting inputs and conveying them forward. What they need to be doing is to um, doing a, a, co a compression based on the statistics of their input, like a principal components, um, yeah. isolating the signal. Um, so there, there, are, there are some recordings from the ponds, from the ponting nucleus, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about the recordings that have been done and your predictions about how the input should be organized. Yes, so um, I did actually look at some of the recordings. Um, I think I was in contact with, with Britton Sauerbrei who did some of these recordings. Um, uh, in the end, I did uh, I, I did not include that analysis uh, in the paper because it was so essentially it's we are still limited by the number of neurons which we are recording in the ponds. Uh, but I would say that some of what I I would expect to see based on our theory at least is an increased presence of um, the activity which is relevant for the task. In the ponds compared to compared to the cortex, and possibly um, a large uh, lower correlations to some degree, and uh, and one additional thing that I would expect to see is that because we uh, I didn't show you I didn't show you today, but I showed uh, we also showed that um, essentially nonlinearities in the ponds would be sort of harmful. We would expect to see um, a more that the neurons in the ponds are you know in a more linear regime compared to cortical or cerebellar neurons. And this, so yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you so much, Diego. You had a question. Yeah, Sam, that's fascinating, and I really like it because when you compare two different systems, you learn a lot. And in the olfactory I... system, in the Mendelian olfactory system, what we've seen is when the animal is discriminating two odors, mm -hmm. the output optimizes to what would be principal component, com components for the two odors. And I wonder whether you have thought about the third system. So have you thought about your model in terms of the DG, the hippocampus, you know, the dentate gyros to CA3? And what would that difference tell you? 
Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I've been trying to think of, of the hippocampus. Uh, we are typically a bit uh, reluctant to interpret the hippocampus as a cerebellum-like structure. I think many people would be very uh, not happy with this. Uh, I guess the main difference, which complicates a lot our conclusions, is that uh, there is a um, there is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's. Um, it's uh, harder to think of the, the crown cell layer as being this random mixing uh, fit forward layers or mostly fit forward layer as we think of it in the cerebellum. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, in principle, I still think, I think we, we could maybe say something. It's just, I, we haven't done it yet. Yeah, yeah that's, so, that's very interesting. Yeah, that, I'm thinking more mostly of the Kaiko Gajik. Uh, uh -huh. they, they tend to also look at the hippocampus, but there's a yeah. big that they point out thank you yeah 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 so we, uh, for this reason we haven't we haven't got it to that yeah. Solomon hi thanks Sam so um the last point you made about that you know because of the learning that the compression layer you have a higher correlation at the granule cell layers yeah so I guess so what you're saying is that the results fit with um uh, with random connections, but the fact that it's more correlated means that the capacity, at least, would be lower, right? With that, you would agree. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think the 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 key, or at least what we think is the key to understand this sort of uh, counterintuitive result, is that the task is itself um, relatively low dimensional, or at least the way we look at the task is low dimensional. And uh, because we only reduce the, the task to a, a set of relatively few variables, so turn to the, you know, go straight, turn to the left, or turn to the right. So we have a relatively few task relevant dimension to look at. Uh, it would be interesting to sort of find a way to describe this, this task in a richer way so that maybe we could, we could find more structure in the data. Cool, thanks. Well, thank you so much, Sam, and thank, thank you, you all. For, Thanks uh, again uh, for inviting me. Us. It's good to see you. Um, I hope you have a wonderful week. Happy Tuesday and Happy New Year. Thank you.